the French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre once famously wrote, Hell is other people. Speech, the lead singer for the hip-hop group Arrested Development, sang, Maybe I could be the you for you, and you could be the you for me, too. Only one of these statements is consistent with grounding the Zen understanding of the world. And, spoiler, it's not the Sartre. Hell is other people. Um, this wasn't a judgment on other people on Sartre's part. It was simply other people are there. Um, this I that I find myself as that goes out into the world. I can be sitting in the park in reverie, experience, and then there's somebody there. And what's my relationship with them? Oh, and this is Sartre's example too, not mine. I can be staring at somebody unawares through a keyhole. And then I hear a noise on the stair behind me and suddenly I'm worried. I'm looking over my shoulder. There's somebody else there. It's not that other people are bad. It's just that they're a complete buzzkill that they exist. Myself, my self-sufficient, self-reliant self, they get in the way. Now we can... Yeah, we can call this a male myth, actually, can't we? It's the, I am self-sufficient. I can do it on my own. I depend on nobody. I am strong. I am a thing unto myself. The other. Maybe I could be the you for you, and you could be the you for me too. Is from the beginning about relationship. Now it's interesting, the lyrics of this song, as they go on, it's talking about um, he's wanting, well, okay, it's a song about a potential romantic relationship, looking for a life partner. But this is embodied, it's grounded, he's wanting to, as he says, share the knowledge, he's wanting to share the love the experience of the love that his mother gave him as a child. It's grounded in relationship, in mutuality. And what I wanted to talk about this evening is the idea of recognition and how we can actually think of recognition in the sense of relationship. There are different senses in which recognition gets talked about and this one we can call it intersubjectivity, we can call it mutual subjectivity, and I'm pointing there specifically at the work of the psychoanalyst, feminist, cultural theorist, and actually Barry's life partner, Jessica Benjamin. Um, awesome human being, a really powerful thinker, um, and her idea of recognition as intersubjectivity is, I think, central to this way of thinking, a Zen understanding of the world. Let's begin to explore that a bit. Last talk on shame, I was talking about the way that our own personal sense of self, our own personal sense of subjectivity, emerges from this we of mother and child together. And of course there's different ways you can understand that as well. The way that um, Jessica Benjamin and many others have begun to understand that, um, and we're talking what, the last 30 years really in developing this particular understanding and it takes off from some fairly well-known sources which we won't go into this evening. But not that you have 
what is one thing and then that slowly splits into two and then of course I'm free now being me to go off in my way in the world as a separate thing. It's much much more interesting than that. Rather it's that I find myself as me through being part of a we and in fact I find that I exist through relationship. How does this work? It's complicated. Um, it depends on each partner in this relationship. We'll call them mother and child. Other caregivers are available. But still, in most cases, we're talking mother and child. Mother and child, well, child begins to realise that it shares what we'll call a sense of agency and vulnerability with its caregiver, with its mother. Of course, it doesn't think in those terms. It sees that when I make a face, the other makes a face back. When I cry, this happens. When mother rocks me, I feel like this. It also sees that, it, it, yeah, when I make a face, she makes a face back. And in fact, maybe she makes the same face mirroring me. Maybe she makes a different face. Maybe she comes and makes a face at me and then I make a face back. And it's this beginning of a sense of mutual interaction, relationship. The I, the sense of a being which has its own agency, I feel, I want, I need, I don't. Agency and vulnerability. This both comes out of this sense of interaction. Don't want to spend too long on this, but you know, things like singing, singing together, joining in a song. And this, this evolves as the infant turns into a toddler, turns into a slightly larger child. Things like the game of Peepo. Gone. Here. Gone. Here. Or whichever version we're going to be playing that in. And actually, the sharing. The sharing is what's important. The delight. The joy. The love of affecting and being affected by an other recognising oneself as being a self in relation to an other, this very particular other. It's a bit of a funny term, but Benjamin talks about this in terms of making a space, and she calls this space third. The third, it's not me, it's not you, it's a something else, it's the third. And these early ways of making a space, they're all about rhythm. They're all about exchange, reciprocity, building relationship through just this coexisting in this sound space, this physical space, this space of repeated touch or sound, exchanging looks. And again, relying very much on rhythm. In actual fact, weirdly, this is very much something we do in Sangha. We have the basic rhythm of Sangha. We greet, we sit. We listen to the bell at the same time. When the bell sounds again, when the clapper sound, we do this. We walk. When the clapper sound again, we sit. When the bell sounds, we chant. We follow David. We make the same movements with our mouth. Our vocal cords make the same kind of resonance at the same time together. Now you can either do that kind of, oh yes, every morning we chant the company song and that's fantastic, I really so enjoy it, I feel so valued, way. Or we can just, exp no, we're sharing. This is what we're doing. We're literally, our bodies, our minds, we're doing the same thing at the same time. We share, we share our likeness. 
And this is part of the delight of Sangha. We come here and we can, we can make a space. We can make a space for the unknown, for the unexpected. How's the talk going to be? How's the chant going to be? Who's going to say what? What's going to come up when I'm sitting? We make a safe space. We make a container for the unknown, the unexpected. Anything could happen. And that's the joy of relationship. And that's the joy of making a space where we know what's the framework. We know what we can call the rules or the frame we're going to improvise on this evening's Sangha, this encounter, this morning's play session between mother and child. Who knows where it's going? Now, of course, Sangha is regular. It's a very special kind of container. Most relationships, and certainly, you know, our experience of our relationship with our caregiver, and then if we're parents, our experience as parents, it wasn't all lovely. It isn't all lovely. Sometimes it's actually pretty vile. Um, what happens? Well, there's breakdown. But actually an essential part of any relationship is experiencing rupture and repair. Things go wrong. But because we have a relationship, because we share that mutual being, in a sense, I am because you are, you are because I am, we're both invested. We both want that relationship to continue. Out of our space, out of this space of the third, we rebuild, we repair, we find. Maybe, if it's a solid relationship, that can contain the acknowledgement of where it went wrong, even an apology even the accepting of an apology or some equivalent of this, some way of just acknowledgement of breakdown and then coming together. Depending on whether we're child or adult, and this is the basic pattern of all relationship, set up when we're tiny but which we carry through. Maybe we shake hands, maybe we hug, maybe we kiss, whatever. We repair, we find beyond this space we thought we've built, which has collapsed, a bigger space, a stronger space, hopefully a tighter connection. Again, Benjamin talks about this in terms of a, a special kind of space, third space. She calls it a moral third. She talks in terms of lawfulness. We know what happens when the rules break down. We know what happens when the relationship breaks down. We still have a commitment to refinding relationship, however we do that. So if she's using the term lawfulness, it's not in the sense of judgment and punishment. It's absolutely in the sense of refinding connection, refinding the joy, refinding the love. And it is about joy. And it is about love. But not between two entirely separate beings. Between, well, it's this relationship which is real. And you and I exist as poles in that relationship. And the basic script for that relationship is, I matter to you. You matter to me. In fact, I matter because I matter to you and you matter to me, and I matter because I matter to you, and I matter to me. I am the you for you. You are the you for me, too. Kind of the complicating factor is another sense in which we use the term recognition. And in some ways this is a more common sense 
It's closer to identity and identification. I recognise you as. And even in that first caregiving relationship, there's as. Obviously, mother has to reckon the child, has recognised the child. That's a baby. That's actually my baby. That's actually my responsibility. And everything which one has ever heard, read, experienced about being a mother and what a child is and how one should relate to the child will be there immediately helping, hindering. As soon as we start to go out into the world, that gets so much more complicated. We're dealing with people that we don't really know, that we don't have any significant relationship with, that we have to rely on completely different sets of rules, um, sometimes very sketchy. And all the time we're having to make judgments, identification as, oh, you're that kind of person, you're this kind of person, you're a man, you're a woman, you're an adult, you're a child. You look dodgy. I like you. And so on and so on and so on and so forth. Underneath that first sense of recognition that I was talking about, well, remember when we were talking about shame, we were talking about it's not, it's not a judgment about something I've done. It's a judge about what I am. It's a global judgment. And it absolutely, there's no difference in our first relationships between I matter to you and I matter. End of story. I matter to the world. I am important. I have a place in the world. This is really important. So in recognition, there's, there's an implication of a global judgment. Yeah. You're there. I'm here. I recognise you. I see you matter. And that's, well, I guess, one of the most important things I'm trying to point to this evening is the way that all of these things link up. Passing somebody on the street. Do we reach out to each other? Do we acknowledge each other? You're there. I'm here. You matter. I matter. It's important that we're here. Do we... Avert our eyes, look busy. Do we challenge? Now again, that's going to depend on so many things. The kind of identifications that I'm making. Do I feel threatened by you? I might not want to make eye contact. Can I reach out? Can we share a moment? And actually, just as, you know, like playing when you're tiny, how do we make these little moments, these moments of thirdness when we're adults? Well, we share a look. We share a gesture with somebody. Maybe we smile. Maybe we share a joke. Just something which says, no, we're both on the same wavelength here. We're thinking in the same way. We're alike. We're different people. But we're alike. We're both here. I matter. You matter too. It goes right the way from those totally casual encounters in one direction to um, our significant relationships really being the one, the you, for somebody in particular. Whether that's partners, children, really significant friendships. But then in the other direction, it goes right the way through to all the institutions which recognise us, through which we are recognised or not. And again, the importance of being somebody, having a place in this world through that recognition or that lack of recognition. And here, choosing a specifically British example, I was thinking of the Windrush scandal as an example of what happens when at every level, that recognition breaks down. We remember, I'm sure, we'll know perfectly well that in the 50s, 60s, Afro-Caribbean 
People were invited to come over and make up shortages in the labour force. Oh, how familiar. Although they faced a variety of forms of racism when they came, they came as British citizens. There was no question. They had a right to enter this country. They had a right to remain because they were simply British. They might be challenged in all kinds of ways, but they were simply British. There was no need to make special provisions. There was no need for special documentation. There was no need for records to be kept. And of course, in due course, most of their own bits of paper got lost. The government destroyed tons of the relevant documents so that these were people left without certification, without documentation. But why would that matter? Because they were simply British. Raising families, raising children, doing jobs, paying taxes, forming communities, taking part, being simply British. And then, of course, in the 1970s, the rules were changed so that you were not a British citizen if you were not born here or various other conditions were not fulfilled. And then in the hostile environment of more recent times, you were asked to produce paperwork to show that you were not a dreadful, strange, imposter foreigner taking advantage of the British public and their finances. Documentation, which of course, the government had destroyed its documentation. You were very unlikely to have retained all of yours for the past, what, 50, 60 years, perhaps more so. How does that work? But the point is that suddenly, from having an identity, from being formally recognized by the state, you were suddenly evicted from your place of work and forbidden to find another job. You were denied rights to education. Your children could find themselves denied rights to education. The access to free universal health care, which for the last 75 years has been a cornerstone of what it is to be British, suddenly you were denied access to that as well. And the list goes on. It's not just a series of material disadvantages. It's a series of ways of being absolutely denied your existence through relationship, of being, in one sense, abolished through being abolished as a citizen and moved to the other side of a binary pair. Can we begin to imagine what that actually means? Or for so many of those who arrive in this country or Europe or America in search of asylum or opportunity, only to be fine that they're consigned to the realm of the barely human, the minimally human. And so recognition which at one sense is all about this mutuality. I am because you are. I matter because I matter to you and you matter to me. It becomes simply about identification, about being an object that is looked at, catalogued, processed. And that even if you were to sit down with a Home Office official who genuinely tried to meet your gaze, to share a joke with you, would that matter? Could that count? There are so many questions which beginning to think in this way opens up because this is clearly an ethical issue, clearly a moral issue. And if we remember back to Benjamin's idea of the moral third, well, to make this situation actually lawful in a sense of 
shared values, something which we can all assent to, you would have to understand the injury. You would have to acknowledge the injury. And here again, we have a real problem. It was eventually recognised that there was an issue here. Reparations were to be made. A report was commissioned. Its recommendations were made. And apart from the unbelievable slowness of the process of processing and repairing and trying to do some, undo some of the very real harm which was done, we now find that our government has repudiated the recommendations of the report that were designed to never let this happen again. No restitution, no acknowledgement, and hence, in an ethical sense, no, no possibility of establishing an ethical relationship, of establishing any kind of moral third between those injured and, well, implicitly, all of us, this community which has pushed out. So what can we say about what constitutes recognition? Whether the intimacy of a loved one, whether the generalised encounters that we have in the world, or whether the encounters which we have with organisations and institutions or our representatives of society as a whole, To be real in this sense, recognition has to be mutual. We have to recognise each other as of equal value, equal worth, equal mattering. Not strict equality. There's no way that mothers and children are equal with or to each other. But they both value each other. That we have to embrace mutual obligation that goes with that relationship. If I matter to you and you matter to me, we have to freely accept that as a mutual obligation. And it demands our empathy. We are alike. I feel for you. We are different. I don't feel your feelings. But because I am a vulnerable being, with its desires, its wishes, its thoughts. I appreciate, I can understand, I can feel what it's like to be a vulnerable being with their own desires, needs, thoughts. And what happens when that breaks down? Well, instead we get defensiveness. We get, no, it wasn't like that. We get virtuousness. No, I'm right. I haven't done anything wrong. You don't understand. Your sense of injury is imaginary or it was accidental. And what else happens is, well, I have to actually dissociate. I have to dissociate myself from my feelings. I have to dissociate from my empathy. I have to be, in my own terms, all good. No, I'm, I'm, I'm the virtuous one here. I'm in the right. I cut off, I cut off from you, but I also cut off from myself and the possibility that I might be wrong. How can we make sure this doesn't happen? Well, maybe fundamentally by listening, actually hearing people's stories, actually listening to what our partner, our child, our parent, the asylum seeker, the excommunicated citizen, the prisoner, whoever, have to say, not necessarily simply and straightforwardly believing everything, but listening and feeling and acknowledging that connection. I am a being like you. I am not you, but I am a being like you. Pat 
perhaps we could rephrase Sartre's hell is other people more consistently with this notion of recognition, of mutual recognition as being the foundation of ourselves, our own identity. Maybe we could say that life is other people, but yeah, sometimes that feels like hell. If we recognize each other, we build. We build openness, we build possibility. Get back to the sixth precept again. But if I fail to recognize you, in that failure, not only are you harmed, but I'm diminished. All beings are diminished. Because by failing to acknowledge you, by failing to recognize you as a fellow being, I fail to recognize myself and everybody else and the world. The fantasy that I am alone, I am enough, we are all separate. Maybe I could be the you for you, and you could be the you for me, too. For all of us.